Good evening. I'm Alan Mattiso of the Baker Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome everybody here tonight. I think uh, this is a, a really special occasion because it marks one of the final times that Ambassador Dirigian will be on this platform in his capacity as the founding director of the Baker Institute. Tonight he's not going to be talking about the Middle East or many of the other public policy issues he's interested in. This is going to be an opportunity for him to look back at his past and remember um, his accomplishments. His career began when he joined the Foreign Service after graduating from Georgetown, did a stint in the Army in Korea, and then began his march up the ladder uh, of the Foreign Service. Uh, he has served in, uh, for, in, in eight administrations. He's had posts uh, that were uh, extremely exciting and important in, in Moscow, and in fact, in the Reagan White House. And he reached the pinnacle uh, of his career in the Foreign Service uh, when he became uh, Assistant Secretary uh, of State for the Near East and Ambassador uh, to Syria and Israel. He was in Israel when uh, Secretary Baker, they worked together very closely on Middle East initiatives uh, during the first Bush administration, persuaded uh, Ambassador Dirigian to come to the Baker Institute and be the first director. And I always wondered whether that first year he thought it was a good idea. <laughs> he had a hole in a wall in the library, a small desk, a flag, and one assistant, and that was it. Uh, he, he was at ground zero. But he had certain, um, certain abilities. He first of all understood what this could be. He had a vision of the Baker Institute, and he adhered to it. The other advantage he had was an ability to spot talent, to recruit it, and to retain it. And over the years, this institute has, under his direction, collected a group of research scholars uh, who have made a difference in the world of public policy. Their, their research, their publications, their public appearances, their testimony before congressional committees and, and, and state legislatures, they have mattered. And they have mattered to the extent that this place, which began under Ambassador Dirigian as a hole in the wall, is now the number one ranked university affiliated think tank in the world. <laughs> Ambassador Dirigian did that. But he did something else I'd like to mention tonight that maybe doesn't get the attention it deserves. I've been here for decades, and for many of those decades, we always refer to rice uh, inside the hedges. And that was a metaphor that meant that those hedges were a wall, and there was the outside world, and then there was rice in splendid monastic isolation. Ambassador Dirigian did that. You just have to take a walk around these walls and see the pictures of all the statesmen who have been here uh, over the years. Or take a look at our, our, our archives and see the roster of distinguished journalists and, and politicians and intellectuals who have been on this platform to talk about public issues and often have engaged with our students. Or take a look at our, our student affiliate, uh, the uh, uh, Baker Institute uh, Student Forum which has attracted a very large uh, student constituency. Many of those students do research with our, with our fellows on important projects. A number of them have benefited from our subsidies. We, pay, we, we support internships in Washington generously for students to work in the government and in NGOs, and in many times, they are the occasion for the beginning of a career in public service. The Baker Institute and Ambassador Dirigian changed the culture of rice. And that, sir, is a great accomplishment. So 
So his partner tonight in conversation is my colleague and friend for decades in the history department, Professor John Bowles. Uh, Professor Bowles is a graduate of Rice University, class of 1965, got his PhD at the University of Virginia, and in 1981 he returned home to the history department, and since then, until his recent retirement, he was the exemplar of what a Rice professor should be, a prize-winning teacher, a scholar who wrote 12 books. Personally, I'm in awe of that, um, and books good enough to make him one of the most distinguished scholars in his field, which is the history of the American South. He edited a leading journal. Whenever a president of the university had a tough job to do, more often than not, they asked John, and he did it. Uh, it's been a tremendous career here at Rice. And if you want to know his stature, I can just tell you this. Ambassador Dirigian could have picked anybody from the Rice faculty to be his partner here tonight. He picked John. Uh, and, um, sir, that's not bad. <laughs> so what's going to happen is we'll have about 45 minutes of conversation and then about a half hour of question and answer. You can see these microphones in the aisle. If you have a question, just get up and get in line and you can ask it. So uh, Ambassador Dirigian and Professor Bowles, you have the platform. Get one. The lights are bright. <laughs> No privacy, John. Mm -hmm. You're mic'd. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you say. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I, I have to say how honored I feel that both to be chosen to do, play in this role. I mean, two of the people that I most respect at Rice are on this program with me, so I feel I'm in really good company. Uh, I just want to begin by saying I remember uh, I went to a press conference in the Founders Room at Lovett Hall in uh, January of 1993. And President Rupp, who was about to leave, announced the establishment of something called the Baker Institute. And I didn't, ha I had no idea what it would be or what it could be, and I assumed it would be primarily foreign affairs. And then uh, a, a couple months later, uh, he asked me and Dean uh, McIntyre if we would chair the committee that would handle or oversee the groundbreaking for this building. So we did that. And again, I didn't, I didn't quite know what would happen. But I did get to know Ambassador Dirigian. And I remember walking around the campus in early, in 1994 when he was here. And he came up to me and he recalled a quote uh, that our first president, Edgar Odell Lovett, had made in 1908 when he was planning the university. And Dr. Lovett had said, I believe we have the patience and the power to do the things right, do the thing right. And Ed stopped a minute and said, the patience and the power to do the thing right. And I think it's absolutely clear that he has fulfilled that aspiration. And it's really appropriate, as Alan Madison said, that on the occasion of, the, of this institute being named the number one university affiliated think tank in the world, that we uh, celebrate what he has done. Now, I was given an assignment of not to talk much, which <laughs> for 50 years I talked in 50 minute segments, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to control myself. But I want, to, I want to, in some sense, begin where Alan talked and ask the ambassador to say something about his career before he came here, focusing on what he think, what thinks was most important in that career to prepare him for what he would do here. Well, thank you, John. John, I'm, I'm personally honored that you accepted to play this role tonight because I esteem you a great deal. And I'm, I'm humbled because I know the last time you had a conversation in writing your book on Thomas Jefferson was with him. So I think that this is <laughs> 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 So 
I'm, I'm going to his house tomorrow, too. So, <laughs> so I'm truly honored. I, I mean that so sincerely because I respect you so much. Well, the Foreign Service, uh, you know, when Francoise and I agreed to take this on, uh, and I must say at the outset that uh, Francoise, my main brain as Secretary Baker Colzer, has been my partner throughout this whole uh, itinerary here at Rice. Uh, Baker approached Francoise. <laughs> I was just the ambassador to Israel, <laughs> a nobody. <laughs> and he approached Francoise and convinced her that this is what we should do. So the rest was destiny, you know how we are. Uh, we live in a democracy, but in our homes we live in a matriarchy and we listen <laughs> to our wives. <laughs> so uh, basically uh, we, we accepted. It was really a, a, a roll of the dice because we knew nothing about academia. Uh, I didn't have a PhD. And uh, I knew nothing about Texas. Uh, and I had a pretty good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were very, we were content where we were, but the challenge that was presented to us when Francoise and I sat down is, how many times in one's lifetime do you have the opportunity to create something from the ground up, right. to do something that isn't there, and to create something new. And it, it, again, I, I repeat, it's a roll of the dice, because we could have failed yeah. in, this, uh, in this endeavor. But we took it on, and it's been, a, uh, it's been a tremendous ride, and we had our difficulties. But to answer your question, the Foreign Service was excellent training for dealing with you on the faculty. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I joke once, uh, you've, several of you have heard this, but uh, I was told by you also and by people like Alan Mattiso, if you don't get the faculty on your side, you are dust in a university setting. So I used whatever diplomatic skills I had and, uh, to engage the faculty. And I remember in that Fondren Library hole that we mm -hmm. were put in, which was a nice hole, but it was a hole in the Fondren Library, uh, I had a meeting with three very preeminent economists here in the economics department that you all know, and uh, that, well, you and Alan would know, and uh, they were driving me nuts. They were being so difficult. Y you know, you, what are you going to do here? What are you going to take away from us? Uh, are you going to take assets away from us? Are you, going to, are you going to diminish the pie? And I said, no, we're going to be here to expand the pie at Rice. And I, I wasn't getting anywhere. And it's rare. I am a very patient man. But it was rare. I lost my diplomatic call, and I told him, you know, I'd rather be dealing with the Israelis and the Palestinians than with you. <laughs> <laughs> And as soon as those words left my mouth, I said, oops, <laughs> wrong thing to say. But John, it was a eureka moment. Yeah. I saw the expressions on their faces. And there was one economist you know, Bob Brito, who was giving me a really tough time, and who turned out to be one of our closest collaborators. And he smiled and he said, ambassador, are we that difficult? <laughs> and at that moment, I knew what I had to do. Yes. And that Good. was really, I'm, I'm, that was the breakthrough. Good. That was the psychological breakthrough, Good. if you had. But what I learned in the Foreign Service is uh, negotiations and the art of compromise and uh, the ability to listen, which my wife tells me I don't do enough of, but to listen and to uh, start out by knowing where your interlocutor is coming from. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. We could talk a little more about that later, but that, that's how it started out. So I think my foreign service career really prepared me very well for academia. Good, good. What you say reminds me so much of uh, why Edgar Odellovic came here when this was a city of 75,000. The paved roads didn't come out this far, and he had an endowed professorship at Princeton with a house on the campus. He gave it all up 
to come to an institute that didn't exist in a town that was hardly worth mentioning because he saw the challenge. Exactly. He saw the opportunity to do something, to create something that could fill a vacuum and be really important. And he too made that choice. Oh, we're uh, proud to follow that tradition. That's, yes. That's a, uh, well, you, when you quoted him, you were clearly indicating you were following in his footsteps. Well, how, how, how would you say that your, uh, your original vision, vision of what the Institute could become has evolved over time? Or has it remained fairly constant? It remains fairly constant. In the beginning, uh, we, we, we had really in-depth discussions with Secretary Baker and, uh, and, and the concept we came up with, I can summarize, which frankly is the concept that exists today. That one, we would be a, an integral part of Rice University. We wouldn't be something on campus, but separate mm -hmm. from the university. Two, that we would be nonpartisan, mm -hmm. uh, because I feel very strongly that a university, and I'm not ex exaggerating when I use this adjective, is a sacred space mm -hmm. for the discussion, analysis, and the dissemination of mm -hmm. ideas from all sides. Mm -hmm. So that we would be nonpartisan, part of the university, and that our research would be data-driven as much as possible. That's certainly the case like for our energy studies, our, cent our Center for Energy Studies, mm -hmm. our Center for Public Finance, but even in the humanities and the mm -hmm. soft sciences, that it be objective analysis. And that the Institute's purpose was the creation of ideas that would serve policymakers in the private sector, in the public sector, in, within academia, and the general public. Mm -hmm. The idea was to do the public good. Right. And we had this terrific base at Rice University, and we built on it. The one thing that I added to that uh, original concept, uh, this was after I was here for a year, I said, I wonder what the other university-affiliated think tanks are doing. So. I took a trip. Malcolm Gillis, the president at the time, was very nervous about that trip. <laughs> and I said, you know, Malcolm, I'm going to take this trip. He says, where are you going? I'm going to go to Harvard, to the Kennedy School. I'm going to go to Stanford, uh, Hoover Institution. I'm going to go to Princeton, to Woodrow Wilson Center, Columbia, et cetera. And I said, by the way, this is what got Malcolm really upset. I love Malcolm. He's a real character. but. But, but the thing is, I said, I'm also taking a Houston Chronicle journalist with me. He went up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> he went up the wall. Uh -huh. And I, he said, why are you doing that? They're going to write a negative story on you. I said, no, I'm going to, because to avoid a negative story, because the rumor is that, frankly, that the Baker Institute is going to be an instrument for James A. Baker III to run for the presidency mm -hmm. in 1996, mm -hmm. that I was one of his political henchmen, that uh, you know we were we were going to be biased in our you know there were all sorts of rumors. It was difficult. I I, I don't want to underestimate the difficulties we faced in those early years. There were difficulties of perception, mm -hmm. and so I said I'm going to take this. Uh, it was Todd Ackerman. Uh, the Houston Chronicle, uh, at the time he was a, a high, higher education mm -hmm. journalist. So I, I called Todd, I said, would you like to accompany me on this trip? He said, I'd love to. And so I brought Todd with me and uh, I'll never forget, I had to wake him up. We were in the Waldorf Astoria, we were going to Columbia University, he was still asleep and I had to wake him up to join me with the trip. <laughs> and showed you his enthusiasm for all this. But, <laughs> but, but, but the point was that Todd came back and wrote, not not a puff piece, but he wrote an objective piece that we were striving to establish our own think tank in the heart of Texas, in the you know, fourth largest city in America, in one of the best private universities in the country. And so it worked out well. Uh, we were getting to that, what I call that perception of objectivity early on. But when I came back from that trip, John, the one thing that I, I think I really added to the original concept was, and the only thing I learned at Georgetown in Economics 101 was the principle of comparative advantage. 
I came back and I said, when I thought of what Stanford and Harvard were doing, I was, I was truly humil humbled. And I said, how can we compete? We're not on the West Coast, we're not on the East Coast, we're in Texas. How can we compete with these great institutions that have tons of researchers, uh, big cash flow, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And the decision I made at that time, we're not going to ape anybody. Yes. We're not going to imitate anybody. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to build our research agenda indigenously based on what we have here. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. Houston, the energy capital of the world. That was the first program I started, mm -hmm. was our energy forum. The Texas Medical Center across the mm -hmm. street, our Center for Health and Biosciences. Great economists here, the Center for Public Finance, and eventually being on the border with Mexico, one of the most important bilateral relationships we have in the world. And we did a study. No university was really looking at the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship as a major policy issue for the United States. They were all working around the edges. Mm -hmm. Some in the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington was doing good work. But no one was really focused on this, this fundamental relationship we had with Mexico, but as a gateway to Latin America. This geographically is our, our, mm -hmm. our comparative advantage right. being in Texas yes. and being a Rice University. So we launched the uh, US-Mexico Center. And then, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go down the line on everything of the programs we have. We have drug policy, we have religion and politics. Bill Martin is here now. And we, uh, we have, you know, Bill, Bill has done great work on the role of religion and politics. We have in our Center for the Middle East, which we created because of Baker and myself and our diplomatic experience. It's a very prominent center. But in that center, we have Mohammed Tabar, for example. He's an Iranian scholar who wrote a fantastic book on the nexus between politics and, and, and religion in Iran. So it was all built on this principle of comparative advantage. So, you know, I feel we can look at our constituencies saying that we're not trying to imitate anyone. Right. We're doing something that we ourselves can yes, do right. Yes, good. And that model, that model prevails today. Good. Let me ask you this. I know when you first began here, you began talking about this being a nonpartisan institute. Some people question how did being nonpartisan differ from being bipartisan? And what kind of distinction did you mean? And I have thought since then, wondered how when you have active politicians give talks, how do you prevent them from giving a political speech rather than a talk of real substance? Excellent question. Very difficult for me to answer because I don't have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> but to try to answer your question, look, just two days ago we had Mike Pence mm -hmm. here. The Institute has come to the point, I remember in the early years, we had to beg for VIPs to come mm -hmm. here. We were not known. All of a sudden, we became known. And we are getting now today more, we're not inviting people, they're asking mm -hmm. to come here. Mm -hmm. And these are statesmen, presidents, prime ministers, national leaders, uh, political leaders, whatever. But we got a call from Pence's office, he wants to come and talk about energy. And I knew exactly where he's coming from, energy independence, which our Center for Energy Studies, which is the number one ranked mm -hmm. uh, right. energy yes. policy yes. In, in, in the world, uh, you know, under Ken Medlock's great uh, leadership, uh, we, uh, I said, of course, the, vice, the former Vice President of the United States. And if anyone questions me why I've I'm, I've accepted that. I just say, well, you know, I sat down here with Nancy Pelosi. We've had Joe Biden here. We've had John Kelly here. Don't talk to me about, we are, again, I want to repeat this phrase, a sacred space for people of all political views to express themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Pence gave a political speech. Mm -hmm. He gave a political speech, but that's okay. Because the point of the matter is that we allow everyone to come mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. to give, you know, mm -hmm. express their views. And, and I think for universities at large, I think we have to avoid, I may be getting myself in trouble, but I'm leaving. 
but we have to avoid political correctness. Yes. We have to avoid political correctness. You know, that, that we, we have to be true to ourselves as Americans that we are capable of Americans to listen to, absorb the ideas and positions of all sides and make up our own minds. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> do, you, do, do you think that in today's, I guess I would say, hyper-partisan age, that non-partisan think tanks have an especially important role to play? Even more so yes. today. Yes. I think it's never been more relevant than, uh, than today. I mean, I mean, a great crisis in our country. You're the historian yes. <laughs> of the South, but the Civil War, yeah. uh, you know that. That was the great, the, the great defining, one of the great defining moments of the United, in United States history. But I think today we're at one of those points where partisanship is a real problem. Uh, I decry the partisanship that we see today in our society and in our government. I remember when I was working for Ronald Reagan as his deputy press secretary for foreign affairs, the Gipper would invite Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House, to come over to the White House and have a glass of scotch with him. It doesn't happen anymore today. We don't have leaders on both sides of the aisle that socialize, that get together, and this is really important because Tip O'Neill and Reagan were really divided on, on the issues, but the ability to talk to one another to not see the other as an enemy, mm -hmm. but to see the other as a political opponent, but not an enemy. And you are the expert. I mean, you wrote the book on Jefferson. You know that the, the founding fathers, the art of political compromise is embedded in our constitution, mm -hmm. the checks and balances. This is what America is about. Political compromise is not a dirty word. Right. Is not a dirty word. The art of politics is political compromise. What is bad in my mind is when you give up your principles and not compromise your principles mm -hmm. as a politician, a political leader, or a corporate head, whatever, a professor, whatever. Don't give up on your principles, but try to find that mountain ground. We've become so partisan even in, on family lives. People, there's just a whole range of topics you can't afford to bring up in all kinds of situations. I mean, it's not just in national politics, but in interpersonal life, partisanship prevents conversation. You, you probably won't be surprised that I would bring up the Jefferson thing here. Not at all. When <laughs> Jefferson was president, two or three days a week, he would invite about 12 or 15 congressmen, senators, department heads, to what was then called the man President's Mansion for dinner. And they would sit at the oval table so that no one was at the head of the table. And they would sit just pell-mell. And the food would come out to him, and he would pass the food around family style. And he was a terrible speaker, but he was a sensational conversationalist. Mm. And he knew how to make quiet people speak up. He knew how to control talking to people. And he would move the conversation around. He knew everything. And everybody felt good. Everybody, they lived in boarding houses in Washington, D.C. He, was, he had French food and the best wine cellar in America. He did, yes. And he, and they, he realized that he said, if people come together, even if they hate each other, if they have a pleasant conversation, they begin to understand each other's issues. They begin to understand the things that motivate them. And out of that kind of conversation, positive compromise can take place. Absolutely. And you feel... That's what he was doing in 1803, 1803. Exactly. And we've lost that ability. And we've lost that. And, and that, were, that is so pertinent, what you just said about Jefferson. And one of my mentors, I've been blessed to have a few great mentors. And my greatest mentor in the Foreign Service was George W. Ball, who was the Deputy Secretary of State during the Kennedy and LBJ administrations. And, uh, and that, by the way, is how old I am. I started out in the, <laughs> in the JFK administration. Certain, you've all heard this. I say I'm so old I can remember the Dead Sea when it was only six. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but, but, but the point is that one of my mentors was a, an esteemed diplomat by the name of Raymond Hare. And I asked him what I said, Mr. Ambassador, what is diplomacy? And he said, uh, Ed, diplomacy is the art of listening. Coming back to Jefferson, he said, you must master your interlocutor's brief as well as he or she knows it. You have to understand what his interests are. You have to convey in the conversation that you know where he is coming from. Mm -hmm. And immediately you are beginning to captivate your interlocutor because he's, be he's perceiving that you understand what his issues are. And once you've established that psychological connection, you start discussing the issues between you. And then you determine whether or not there's any common ground. If there is common ground, you start building on it. If there is no common ground, you have to take the consequences and decide what you're going to do, either stalemate or war, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. But this is the art of diplomacy, and that's what Jefferson, you know, this, this is the art that we are losing, John. This is the art of listening to the other. We are all in this mode of confirmation bias, especially with social media. Either someone's watching Fox News or CNN, or even more relevant, on the iPhone, you know, uh, plugging in to their confirmation bias, plugging yeah. into to, to programs with people that confirm their own biases. And we're not talking to one another. Mm -hmm. And we're not reading anymore. We're on machines. The machines are telling us what to do. Uh, I find, I do too much, like probably everyone, on social media and on our iPhones and all that. But I'll tell you, when I start reading a book, I feel intellectually alive because the relationship between the person and the page, there's some sort of intellectual discourse that's going on that I find is much more valuable than being on a machine and uh, being told what to, to, to mm -hmm. listen to. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to get back to talking to one another, being around Jefferson's table, and, and, and beginning to listen to one another in order to find the common ground. Our country is in trouble. Mm -hmm. We have this partisan divide that has become ideological, and we've lost one of the basic precepts that we talked about, uh, the Constitution, the art of political compromise. And we have issues that are so important. Uh, we know what they are, be it infrastructure, be it the social injustice, economic disparities, uh, be it the environment, climate change, be it crime, be it suicide, mental health. We have all these incredible issues in our country that we have to start uh, addressing. And you cannot address these issues in a polarized mm -hmm. environment, and that's what we're headed into. The abortion issue, that's uh, you know, in the headlines now, for example. And this is something I think that we have to start thinking. I think the key to all of this is not that there are no easy solutions, is education. I think K through 12 education, we are deficient in K through 12 education. We have great universities. They have their problems, but we have great universities in this country. But K through 12 education is critical. You need an educated populace to be able to have good policies because we, the people, elect our leaders. We, all of you, are all responsible individually for who you elect. There's a, one, a great quote from Winston Churchill. They asked Winston Churchill, what's one of the greatest faults of democracy, Mr. Prime Minister? He puffed on his cigar, took a swig of his brandy. He said, a five minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. It's not an elitist yeah. statement. It could be identified as an elitist statement, but it's not. We have to have an educated public. Whether you, write, whether you vote for the right or the left or the middle is not the issue. But to have an educated populace is critical. We're, we're not there. We're not there. Actually, in many ways, it seems to me, you said decisions here would be based on analysis based on evidence and facts and science and so forth. And in many ways, I think our society is less uh, 
sophisticated on science than it was in 1930. Hmm. I mean, the percentage of Americans who don't believe in evolution is higher now than it was in 1940. That's amazing. And uh, you had a, I think it's so important, and I know you believe this, that uh, uh, politicians and diplomats and ambassadors uh, know something about hi the history and the culture and the politics of the world they're dealing with. You had a quote in your book, uh, Crisis and Opportunity, that you said, we cannot try to, we shouldn't try to uh, parachute Jeffersonian democracy onto the sands of Arabia. And I think that you, you then go on and say, we need, to, we need to deeply understand the culture and the politics and the religion and so forth, not just of the Middle East, but of Mexico and every place else. Exactly. And uh, that's one of the things that this institute has tried to emphasize, Absolutely. that we need knowledge-based, scientific-based, medically-based decision-making. Absolutely. And, and we've, we've, we've made some serious foreign policy miscalculations. That analogy of the, uh, I thought that would appeal to you. I didn't know you at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did know yeah, you yeah. at the time. No, I did know you at yeah. the time. But, but you know, parachuting in a Jefferson, amount of, that, that's been something that's bothered me a great deal in my diplomatic career, mm -hmm. is this hubris, this American hubris, that uh, we can somehow impose our form of democracy mm -hmm. on other countries. It's, it's ridiculous. Right, right. The best way for America, in my humble view, to promote democracy is by setting the example of what we do here at home. If we want to be the shining city on the hill, we have to show that we right. are a shining right. city right. on the hill. Right. And, that, <laughs> and, and I was just talking to Steve Lewis, one of our eminent scholars on China. I said the best way to compete strategically with China is to get our act together in terms of infrastructure, technology, you know, narrowing the social injustices of our society, getting our debt under control, this K-12 education, getting the government to start R&D funding like in the old days that Neil Lane has been right, you know, right. proselytizing mm -hmm. for here at the Institute. This is where America can become truly an example, and this is the way to, write, to compete and not get into a situation where we look upon the Russians of the world or the Chinas of the world as adversaries that we have to meet with kinetic force. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous, the path we're going on. But if we have to get our act together in America, and we can do it, I, I find, and I think you'll agree with me, you're the scholar in American history, but one of the and I hope I'm not wrong on this, but I think America has proven that it can repair itself. Mm -hmm. We make a lot of mistakes, but we've had this ability to repair ourselves, stumbling like fools, but we finally get it right. And I hope we haven't lost that. Well, yeah, see, my, one of my major concerns is that we have, I think we've, we've lost faith in the very fundamental institution of elections. And if people will deny the fairness and the integrity of elections, how do we ever recover that? I remember back in 2005, I think the Baker Institute was involved in that Carter Baker uh, yes. commission. I remember yes. them talking here. Uh, I think that's one of the critical issues of our time. And I, do you have any uh, prescription to how we, ha we have, we have an age now in which people deny, I mean, seven, 40% of the people don't believe that Biden was elected president, although there's no hard evidence of significant fraud. How do we as a nation solve that kind of disconnect? I mean, we have to be able to trust elections. That's the key to democracy. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons that uh, Secretary Baker asked me at one point uh, about four or five years ago, he said, uh, you know, he ran five presidential campaigns yeah. and so he knows what he's talking about and uh, he asked me he said what other think tanks are dealing with presidential elections I, I said I'm sure there are and I, but we did a survey none so many think tanks and universities deal with aspects of the US presidency as you know mm -hmm. but no one was focused on presidential elections so we started this program that's proven to be quite successful now on presidential mm -hmm. elections it's mm -hmm. one of our major programs 
and we get together the right and the left. Uh, you know, our first program, uh, uh, we had Carl Rove and David right. Axelrod yes, as yes. co-chairing it, mm -hmm. for example. And we're delving into all the issues that you, you've mentioned. I don't have an answer for your question mm -hmm. because it's complicated, but uh, the Carter Baker proposal was a good start mm -hmm. and and they did you know Carter got in a lot of trouble for that because they they did advocate for voter ID cards and that's a political mm -hmm. issue maybe you could say but but that's just one aspect of it but the point of the matter is that we are looking into this at, at a time when it has become we, we didn't know when we started the presidential elections program that this would be the issue yes. that you've just mentioned yes, now yes. So that we are addressing, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, we have to gain confidence in our electoral, mm -hmm. electoral policy. But I think gerrymandering is yes. a key issue. Yes. Gerrymandering is a, a very key issue. Yes, I agree. I'm embarrassed to look at my, my watch, but I, we have a schedule. I always feel people look at their watch, people say they're bored. I'm not bored. I'm just worried about go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Alan yeah. Madison is going to fuss at me because he went past uh, our line. No, that's but, right. Let me ask you if this. If people are bored, they can leave. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you this question. Uh, this is a, a university affiliated think tank. Can you say more about how you feel that such a think tank should be integrated into the, the undergraduate and graduate student life? I and mean, what, what ideally are the contributions to the student experience? I mean, I, I know I've come to these breakfasts where you have, I mean, I've sat at tables with the French ambassador and undergraduates. And I think that's a wonderful experience. Yeah. But can you say more about the, 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 the university-related aspects of the Baker Institute? Well, when we first got here, uh, you know, being a, a graduate of Georgetown, in the Foreign Service School, whoever went to Georgetown was interested in public right. policy. Yes. Yeah. So when I got to Rice, I was really disappointed. I found very little interest in the student body that I could detect in public policy. The very bright students at Rice, you know, how hard it is to get yeah. into the university. And uh, they were all so driven by their, their heavy curricula, their mm -hmm. minors, majors. And I said, well, we've got a problem here. There's very little interest in the student body in public policy. And, and to me, this was my life. And uh, I said, we've got to inculcate into the students that when you leave these hedges, even if you're a chemical engineer, an electronic engineer, a physicist, a computer engineer, to see nothing about the humanities yeah. and, and the social sciences, which is more relevant to public policy as we know it, you are going to be walking into a political context in your life, even as a scientist, mm -hmm. and as we know that, you know. So we had to work on that. And we worked on it. It took, it, it took several years. It took several years. So I was given, it wasn't our idea, but one day, five Rice students, the kids were dressed in suits, and the ladies, the young ladies were dressed in, they came not, not in student outfits, they mm -hmm. came dressed and they said, Ambassador, we would like your support in establishing the Baker Institute Student Forum. It was music to my ears. <laughs> yeah. It was music to my uh -huh. ears. And it was indigenous. It, yes. came, it came from right. the students. So we started that program. And I'll tell you, if any of you have not had, well, I know many of you have not, if you ever had the opportunity to attend the Baker Institute Student Forum Conservative Club and Liberal Club de presidential debates, they're more edifying than the debates in Washington. <laughs> and these kids really do their homework. I've been so impressed by the manner in which they, they mastered their brief on the right and the left, and they engaged. We've come a long way, John. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. come a long way. We have, uh, Alan mentioned, Alan Madison mentioned the uh, program in Washington, the Jesse Jones uh, Student Internship Program. It's, it's, it's fantastic. David Lieberman says, well, David can't say it publicly because he's the president of Rice University. I can say anything. He says it's, he says it's the best internship program we have on campus. Uh -huh. And, you know, we, we pay for all the students' bills except their bar bills in Washington. <laughs> but we, we pay for everything, and they have to come 
they, they have to get a job in either a government agency or a NGO, and then they have to come back with a policy brief on a very pertinent domestic or foreign policy issue, and we have Rice professors that interview them. We give them awards and all that. Uh, we, we started a Master of uh, Global Affairs program, which, uh, there you go. <laughs> They're one of our bright students is right yes. there. And uh, it was, it was, we didn't know if it would succeed. You know, Alan can tell you, we were, it was iffy. It's blossomed. Ken Medlock is the director of the <clears throat> MECON program, uh, the Energy Economics program, which is highly successful. And we even have a master's program on, on uh, health and biosciences. So we are truly integrated now. All, almost all of my fellows teach a course at Rice. So we are totally integrated into the educational mission of Rice University. But I'm going to tell you a secret. Secretary Baker and I discussed this at the beginning. And when I came back from uh, Stanford in 1995, and I saw the guerrilla warfare between the faculty at Stanford and the Hoover Institution, guerrilla warfare. Mm -hmm. And I told I we gotta, we got to avoid this at Rice. So we decided very deliberately, you talk about patience. Yes. And one of my favorite phases that I use with our kids, strategic patience. I have a very impulsive family, but I keep telling them strategic <laughs> patience. We waited until we started doing these things I mentioned, and then we launched into the educational mission of Rice in order not to get pushback. And it worked. So we are, I can say, we are fully integrated with the ed educational mission of Rice, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. if, I don't know how involved you are with Rice events, but uh, there's hardly an issue facing our nation that the Baker Institute doesn't have somebody focusing on. There are over 150 fellows researching every imaginable field. It's incredible. This whole building, you'd be surprised how many officers are in this building. It's filled up. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. Now, I know I do have a uh, time restraint because we want to have questions. So I want to just end by mentioning that a very famous quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1841, that an institution is the lengthened shadow of an individual. Now that's not fully accurate because any leader of an institution has to attract and retain, as Alan mentioned, a team of dedicated, competent people. And Ambassador de Regions has had the support of the three vice presidents and of course, the, the support of the international prestige of James Baker. But his contribution to taking that sort of idea of a nonpartisan public policy institute that no one here quite could imagine what it could be. And in 28 years, he has built the number one such institute in the world. It's an amazing contribution and we are here to honor your 28 years at Rice. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff. So, yes. schedule, Alan. Uh, now we have, we have 30 minutes for questions, and there, there's a microphone there and a microphone there. So if you have a question, uh, give us your name, ask a question, don't make a speech, and uh, Ambassador DeRigian <laughs> will give you a precise answer. If I can. Yes, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, interesting, as always. Uh, you alluded to my original question, which having dealt with uh, diplomacy with uh, Israel, the former uh, Assad, and, um, and areas around there, as well as uh, university politics, uh, which was the most challenging, and you very diplomatically did not say. 
But uh, as an alumnus, I want to say that establishing a place where um, I could come in for a Middle East program, uh, sit down to have breakfast and discover um, uh, Ambassador Sherman, who would later give the lunchtime talk on the Iranian uh, presentation, just at breakfast or um, sit next to people with Washington Post bylines that I recommend, uh, that I recall. Um, it's such a uh, great thing for Rice and for Houston. So, thank you, thank you. Well, there's no question that the faculty was the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> On this side, remember, try yeah. to ask the question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I deeply appreciate the, uh, everything that you've done, sir, for 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 uh, for this university and for this region. Uh, I think. Uh, we're only, only, we're only going to, be, to begin to understand the full impact in the generations to come, uh, things we can't possibly understand now. Here's my question. Uh, my, by the way, my name is Gilbert Saldivar, uh, 1990 uh, graduate, uh, just an English major, so. Oh. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so as I was, uh, Listening to everything that was discussed, one thing in particular struck me, which was the idea of principle over politics in the discourse that, I'm, I'm butchering what you, what the wisdom that you said, but what I heard was that one of the things that you focus on is trying to cultivate a dialogue or a conversation, a discourse based on principle rather than partisanship, right? Mm -hmm. What seems to me, so, so immediately when I heard that, uh, the, the words of Primo Levi uh, came to mind that when power deals with um, sort of outgroup, inferior, an interlocutor that, that the power structure considers inferior, they play an unprincipled game was the, the phrase that he would use. What seems novel about the present time, and Mike Pence is a particular um, example is that Mike Pence stuck to principle on January the 6th and for that he was punished. And so we have a movement underway where principle is something that is being directly attacked, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put, thank you, I don't want to put, uh, an impossible question before you, but it, it's, I, ahead, I can't try. get it out of my head. Go ahead, How try. can you get people to at least <laughs> understand the principles of what they say they believe in? Because when I talk to people in my own family and you start to scratch a little bit, they have no idea why they believe these things because they do not want to examine why they believe in the things they say they believe in. So that seems to me the fundamental challenge. All the education, that's all part of it. But ultimately, if people, if people are not willing... Okay, that, thank okay. You. okay, that's that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, no, I, I, you've you understand expressed, my you've ex and I understand no, the question. And I do have a question. How do we get people to want to care about principle and what they believe in? Education. It all gets back to all education. Right. Right. And education starts in the family, and then it goes into the schools. And the only way you're going to get a citizenry that acts with principle uh, is through that. That's, that's the answer to that. And, and what you said about Mike Pence, no matter what you think about Mike Pence, if you're Democrat, Republican, whatever, he did make that very courageous decision to certify the vote that Biden was president of the United States. He, he could have done something else. And that, uh, a quick Judy. question? A quick question. So one of the things that hasn't come up yet, and good to see you. Um, just one? Just, just one question, Jay, <laughs> I promise. How do we change the discourse on immigrants? I mean, I was brought here by a group of immigrants from Israel and, and you from our, your family from Armenia. The value of our com country is who comes here. How do we change the game on this? How do we make a state in Texas and how do we make our country believe that people from other places help us, not hurt us? Well, I, I think, you know, the greatest 
greatest symbol we, ha we have of that is the Statue of Liberty in New York. We are a nation of immigrants. There's a great story about FDR. Uh, when FDR was elected president in 1933, if you know where the White House is and, and there's this, uh, the, uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution, they have a fantastic uh, Hellenic building uh, near the White House. And one of the first speeches that uh, FDR made was to the Daughters of the American Revolution. Now just picture this, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his ancestors came to the United States in the 17th century, they were Dutch, you know, in the 1600s. So he was a patroon. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bostonians talk about Brahmins and, you know, but FDR was a patroon. And FDR, God bless him, he got up on the podium and he looked out at this vast audience of ladies of a certain age, all white haired, but with blue tints. And, and he opened up his speech and he said, fellow immigrants. <laughs> that says it all. This is a nation of immigrants. And when we lose that precept, and that's a principled position if you're talking about principles, if we lose that principled position, we're on a downslide. We are a nation of immigrants and we should, we have to go through certain procedures, there's no question about that but our borders should be fluid. They should not be walls. I don't believe in walls. Good, good, good. Okay. Judy. I have two stories about Ed. Oh God. <laughs> I'm Judy, Judy, don't tell these stories. <laughs> I'm Judy Lay Allen and somehow or other, I was lucky enough to be on the search committee for the new director of the Baker Institute. There were two non-academics, Kathy Whitmire, former mayor, and me on this committee. I understand what Ed says when he talks about the difficulty of the faculty. <laughs> I went with five faculty members to Washington DC to interview about six candidates for this role and we came back and we had whittled the list of candidates down to three, one of which was this fellow named Ed Derigian. <laughs> the economics professor that I had traveled to Washington with, who reminded me of Ichabod Crane, <laughs> this <laughs> very opinionated man, but he, we discovered on the trip that we were both golfers, so we had somehow found a common basis. And as we got to discuss Ed Derigian, this guy very hauntedly said, do you realize that he doesn't even have a PhD? <laughs> That's true. There was silence. And I don't know what got into me, but suddenly I said, but sir, he has a PhD in life. <laughs> and do you know what? Ed got the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much that had to do with it, but it did help sway the opinion. So I felt obligated to take Ed and Francois to lunch as soon as they were established in Houston to just welcome them to the community. Ed has always had a great ability to delegate. And I opened my mouth and said, now you all realize that most of the organizations, nonprofit, you know, whatever, educational, have sort of a, uh, a group of people that form together to support them, like the ballet point something or other, the Museum of Fine Arts, connoisseurs, the whatever. It's a group of people that pay money to support the organization. And he said, what a wonderful idea, and Judy, you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Never open your mouth. 
<laughs> but that was the beginning of the Baker Institute support system. The round table. The round table. Yeah. And if any of you here tonight don't belong, please consider it. It's, <laughs> it's $1,200. <laughs> And you get to come to all these wonderful things at the Baker Institute, the talks, both sides of the aisle, etc. Ed and Francois, we're going to miss you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Frank Lecture, I, uh, I'll be short. Uh, You're never sure. No, I am, I am a bit sure. Uh, I agree with your, uh, uh, you brought up the K1 through 12 is yeah. really is in a big shamble. And I believe it was instituted by uh, President Woodrow Wilson right after World War I, who, is, who passed an executive order that all Americans must have a high school degree. So we had to lower our education level so that a, one has to graduate even though may not make it through ninth grade. And his idea was a carpenter is not gonna become a scientist, but it's okay to have 12th degree, uh, I mean 12th, uh, I mean have a high school degree. But did that slow down the teaching process so that the ones who could not catch up with the smarter ones, and, and uh, that way you really had to lower that standard of education. And the other one, could you please explain what does think tank mean? And I'm very honest, I read about it, a dictionary everywhere. Think tank, what does it mean? Uh, it does it mean we support our policies, whether right or wrong, because right. we defend good right. things that we do, which is great, but then we really veer off completely uh, about bad things the U.S. doing around the world. Let me answer your Thank question. You. Let me answer your question. A think tank is not a repetitive voice for existing policy. A think tank is an objective uh, forum to analyze existing policies and policies that could be, which means strategy looking forward. And therefore, we, when I talk about data-driven research, that's what I'm talking about. We, uh, we question authority, we question power, uh, but we do it on a nonpartisan basis and data-driven research. And therefore, we translate. One of the most important offices in the Baker Institute is little known, it's our editorial office. And what do I mean by that? The, our editorial office, just a few people, they translate the, the, the scholarly academic work of our brilliant fellows and scholars into language that executives in C-suite and corporations can understand, that policymakers in Washington can understand, and general public can understand. So our idea is, is to be a critical voice on policies and, and to, to enlarge the debate. We have. We have. That's what we do. That's our existence. Sir, uh, shortly after the founding here, I was privileged to attend a, a small meeting. And you made a very prescient remark. You said to the audience, you should be aware that the leaders in the Middle East are no longer sending their sons to the London School, to Stanford, and to Harvard. And you said they're sending them to the religious schools and the madrasas. And that turned out to be amazingly prescient. Do you have any similar observation about what's going on in that region today that might set the arc for the next few years? Well, the dynamics and change, that's a hold. <laughs> we could spend the five, five hours here. <laughs> the, the dynamics of change in the Middle East now are, uh, are, 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 are evident. Uh, a lot is changing in the Middle East now. And uh, many of the leaders of the Middle East have, have gone to schools in London and here in the United States and in France and elsewhere. But many, many go to religious schools. And, uh, this, and th they're, 
there's a problem of religious extremism in the Middle East, but there's also a problem of religious extremism in the West. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this, uh, this concept that, you know, the problems are all over there, but we have to look into ourselves also. Religious extremism uh, exists uh, everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, someone in this audience wrote a book, God on My Side. It has nothing to do with about Islam, it has to do about Christianity. So what's important is the, I'm, I'm putting myself on the line here, but I believe that the combination of religion and politics is toxic. Religion, one of the great things, correct me if I'm wrong, John, you know, our founding fathers is the freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. The freedom of religion. But the separation of church and state or mosque and state or synagogue and state. That's fundamental in our body politic since the beginning. But when you get the infusion of religion and politics, which we see in our country, you see in the Middle East, you see in Asia and other parts of the world, it's toxic. And I, I don't see any good coming out of that. So what, what is important is to maintain the separation uh, I'm a religious person uh, individually, uh, but uh, my politics is entirely different than my religion. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, th I think I, I tried to. I'm often struck by how amazingly difficult it is for people, all of us, to in some sense uh, widen our own perspective. About 20 years ago, I was sent with a group of people to talk to, talk to uh, German Texans in the German Historical Society in a town in sort of central Texas. And the teachers, the people there at this meeting were all of German ancestry. And they were reminiscing about how terrible it was back in the 30s and 40s when they spoke German at home. When they went to school, the teachers punished them for speaking German. And they thought it was just horrible. And then the same woman a few minutes later said, you know, the biggest problem we have right now in our schools or all these Mexican students who want to speak Spanish, and we cannot, you know. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that actually tells a lot about how we as people act. We, we, exactly. we need, good, to, we need to go example. to a place where we can have a variety of attitudes and concepts and policies addressed fairly and openly and realize. Ambassador, Solomon Islands and China have a security treaty to build a naval base. The greatest generation died on uh, Guadalcanal and Bougainville. Is it legal for the United States to use covert operations to stop that naval base designed to conquer Australia and New Zealand? It's never legal for the United States to use covert operations. <laughs> I mean, but the Solomon Islands, you, you, I, I know the point you're making there. It's, it's a very serious issue and it has to be addressed. And I think what I would do there is, uh, I think the United States should take a leading position in getting together with our allies in the Pacific and see how we can provide security guarantees in, in that part of the world. Uh, but again, I, I want to get to my larger point. The best way for us to confront China is to get our own house in order. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Al Sharif. Uh, I'm studying. I'm getting my master's here on the Global Affairs Program, and I am tall. Um, <laughs> I guess my question is: You touched on our our partisan divides and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For those of us who will be called on to solve these problems in the future, what words of advice do you have? On the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Eh, I mean, partisan issues as well, I mean. Well, we talked about partisanship mostly in a domestic context, but it obviously affects, to your question, our foreign policy. And uh, partisanship at home affects the formulation of foreign policy abroad because a president is hindered by the partisan divides in the country and may not adopt the most wise foreign policies because 
of these partisan restraints at home. We did have an era, Vandenberg, where you know, partisanship in American politics stops at the, river, uh, mm -hmm. the ocean's edge. Uh, unfortunately, that's history. Yeah. Uh, but I think the United States, we should learn the lessons of overreaching overseas. Uh, I think the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was one of the most serious miscalculations in contemporary American Middle East foreign policy. We here at the Institute in January of 2003, we went to war in Iraq in the George W. Bush administration in March of 2003, and I'm putting those dates to show that this is not 2020 hindsight. We knew through our contacts in Washington that the neocons were going to definitely go to war and invade Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein because their ideological uh, precept was that uh, if the United States by use of military force began to topple Arab dictatorships, uh, democracy would spread in the Arab world. That was one of the most misguided precepts uh, ever. Uh, and let me just give you one example of that before I continue. When I was ambassador to Israel, uh, um, you know, we developed, my wife and I developed a very close relationship with the Rabins. He happened to be the prime minister of, of, of Israel at the time and, and a leader that I respected a great deal, the warrior who turned statesman and who lost his life because he made some critical decisions for peace and was assassinated for it. But I remember one conversation with him over a scotch in which he said, Ed, if Israel has to wait for our Arab neighbors to become democratic, we will be waiting a thousand years, quote unquote. He had a knowledge of his neighbors. He spoke Arabic. He, he had a knowledge. And we in Washington, elite foreign policy groups, in this case on the right, uh, sitting in their comfortable offices in Washington and dictating their ideological perceptions on a world that they did not understand. In fact, and I knew, I know these people. I've worked with them the neocons. Uh, they were my colleagues professionally. I knew where they were coming from. Uh, they, they felt that by doing this, there would be a domino theory. Saddam Hussein would fall and then democracy would start spreading in throughout the Arab world, a, a very false concept. But they also thought by so doing, they would be protecting Israel more because Israel would be surrounded by Arab democracies and not by Arab autocrats. This is really, a lot of people don't understand this, this is really what was behind the war in 2003. Now just picture this, the Prime Minister of Israel, who's responsible for the security of the State of Israel, and our folk in Washington, who are dictating a policy that was really based, not a, what we call at the Baker Institute, data-driven research. In January, uh, with my colleague in the CFR in uh, New York, uh, Frank Wisner, we did a joint report, Baker Institute CFR report, post-conflict, guidelines for post-conflict Iraq, because we knew we were gonna go to war. We didn't know when it would happen, it happened right away. Three things in that report that we went to Washington and we peddled to Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, all the, all the, one, by U.S. military might, we will prevail militarily to unseat the regime in Baghdad. That's a given. But the real challenge will be in the post-conflict stage. Recommendation number one, do not dismantle the Iraqi military. Get rid of the top generals close to Saddam, but if we dismantle the Iraqi military, the United States military forces will have to secure the country. 
Do we want to do that? Recommendation number two is based on my experience as ambassador to Syria. Syria, there were two Ba'ath parties, Arab socialist parties. They're called the Arab Ba'ath parties. One was in Syria under Hafez al-Assad. The other one was in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Our recommendation on that was do not dismantle the Ba'ath party. Get rid of the goons at the top. But if we dismantle the Ba'ath party, the United States is going to have to assume civil order, sanitation, running water, electric grids, all that. Do we have the capacity to do that? And then Colin Powell, a dear friend of ours who was Secretary of State, called me and he said, Ed, I know you uh, and the CFR are doing this report. Can you do an addendum, an annex on Iraq's uh, uh, petroleum capacities for Iraq's oil to pay for the, res the reconstruction of Iraq after the war. So our bright you know, Center for Energy Studies people here, they did a report and we came with two kinds. It would need massive foreign direct investment to restructure Iraq's very damaged infrastructure under Saddam, a petroleum infrastructure. And it would take at least five years for Iraq oil to produce enough to start paying for reconstruction costs. I personally peddled these ideas in Washington. They didn't listen. And all those things I said, they did the reverse. Now that's one of the frustrating things about being in a think tank. You can advise, but you don't decide. And I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been in the decider role in government and I've been in the advisory role at the Baker Institute. So one should not have any illusions when you're in a think tank, but you make your best effort to get the best ideas across, and then you have to make the outreach to get to the decision makers. Sometimes you, you're successful, and sometimes you're not. I regret to say that we have met our time limit. I realize there are still questions that want to be, could be asked. In fact, we could stay here for three hours and still have questions to be asked. But I think you get a sense from what you've heard tonight of the wisdom and the uh, leadership and the insights of Ed Gerigian. And you can see through his performance tonight precisely how he's able to, been able to take this vague idea announced in January 1993 and turn it into a wonderful institution that serves this nation and has served this university. We owe him a great debt. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.